So our first topic in the panel discussion, number one, is going to be atmospheric rivers. How would a 21st century NOAA respond? So let's introduce our panelists. Roz Rickaby is a professor of biogeochemistry uh, at the Department of Earth Sciences at the University of Oxford. She's a postdoctoral fellow uh, at University College Oxford and an, an emeritus fellow of Wolfson College Oxford. Bob Bishop is president and founder of the International Center uh, for Earth Simulation. He's a 40-year veteran of international operations for Silicon Graphics, Apollo Computer, and Digital Equipment Corporation, otherwise known as DEC. So thanks very much for being with us today, you two. And let's start with an easy question. This comes in from chat GPT, the first question here. What is an atmospheric river? Can, would one of you like to describe what, what are we talking about here? What is this world? And later on, we can get into where NOAA fits into this whole equation. All right. I took a shot at that, David. Yeah. Good, and welcome, everyone. So it's a wonderful phrase. It's a very picturesque phrase, and that's its value. Uh, it's not 100% accurate, but here's my best definition. In the sky, can you imagine a filament of water vapor, a plume of water vapor being blown along by a high-speed wind, a jet, a jet stream? That's essentially what it is. And when it hits the coastline, if there are mountains, that will uplift the water vapor into a point where it will condense and turn into rainfall or snow, some form of precipitation. So that's what everyone knows will flood you know, the local terrain. Where does it come from? The root of this water vapor is actually around the equator where we have a convergence of what's called the trade winds, northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, they converge, they collide, and there's only one way for the air to go, and it's upwards. So at the equator, we have an intertropical conversion zone, uh, and the, the convection is straight up, vertical, and that's where the water vapor is taken up and caught into the jet stream. So that's my best definition. Very good. And Roz, would you like to add to that? Uh, I'll add a little bit from that, which is just to say that some of that rising air is very much powered by the warmth at the surface of the, of the tropical ocean. And so there is, is certainly concern that with rising sea surface temperatures that Mo just beautifully showed us, certainly for this year, is kind of alarming sea surface temperatures globally. Um, but with those increased temperatures, you get increased convective lifting of that air. And not only that, but the amount of moisture that you can pack into that warmer air increases exponentially. It doesn't just go up linearly with temperature, but it goes up enormously. And so that almost fuels the greater chance for these atmospheric rivers to occur and to contain even more moisture perhaps than they have in the past. Is it possible to stop atmospheric rivers? How would one go about tackling this okay. issue? <laughs> I, was, I was thinking quite deeply about what a 21st century NOAA might do, and, and apart from having a boat. So, I mean, one possibility would be, and, and this is in the realms of imagination, but it's certainly something that scientists are discussing, is can we actually somewhat engineer the temperatures of the oceans? So the oceans are very warm in the surface waters where they're being bathed by, by sunshine. And you almost get, a, particularly in the tropics, a, a nice warm lid, let's say, to the ocean. But in the poles, you have cold water. And the cold water is dense and is sinking and is transporting across the depth of the ocean that we, we saw being dived in so beautifully earlier today. 
So if one wanted to try and cool the surface ocean, one of the things that one could do is just create a little bit of additional vertical mixing where you bring some of those cooler, deeper waters up to the surface, and that would have the impact perhaps of lowering those tropical temperatures and reducing, let's say, the power that's going into those atmospheric rivers. Now I'll say, and this is, this is one of the challenges of many of these ideas for perhaps manipulating the ocean or manipulating our, our environment, is that there will be a byproduct of that. And the byproduct of that is that whilst the, the deep waters are slow moving and cold, they're also accumulating all the nutrients we, we heard being pumped down from those, those phytoplankton in the surface ocean and the carbon. And so if we were to increase the mixing, we'll bring additional nutrients up to the surface. Might be a good thing, we'll create additional blooms of, of phytoplankton. Um, but those phytoplankton, as they drop down, they will respire and use up additional oxygen in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the ocean. So they may take up more carbon at the same time, which is a good thing, but at the same time, they will reduce that oceanic oxygen and that could be a real, real challenge. So it's hard to change the temperatures of those tropical waters without changing other cycles of the ocean. Well, uh, it's not a bad idea, uh, but it's what we would call geoengineering. And as you say, there are risks. Uh, my best advice for NOAA would be simply to build a bigger boat. <laughs> now, you're not talking about the movie Jaws here, right? This is a little more serious. Uh, David, I should have said that these filaments and plumes that we are speaking about, they can be more than 2,000 kilometers long and more than 200 uh, kilometers wide, 200 kilometers by 2,000 kilometers. That's the amount of water that's being, water vapor that's being held. But if I convert that to rainfall, it's greater than the amount of water in the Amazon River, for example, flowing. I don't want to stop the progress of where we're going here, but how does one contemplate or actually in reality deal with a system that is so unbelievably large with such an amazingly large number of particles? This is pretty sophisticated stuff, even to hypothesize, let alone do something in the real world about, is it not? I mean, this is a huge, huge problem to think about. Well, uh, uh, remember, some of those rivers are, are lighter, and the receiving coastline is very happy to have that water. California is very happy to have snow in the Sierra Nevada mountain range which turns into water in summer. It stores the water, the precipitation, one season. So that's very useful, for example, along the western United States coastline. And by the way, that particular atmospheric river is known as the Pineapple Express because it gets going somewhere around Hawaii. And it's a great name to have as well. So. I think the popular press likes to use the phrase, you know, don't worry, this is just a Pineapple Express. For your information, California this winter had nine, nine atmospheric rivers. It, so it took a, quite a beating as a result. But they can occur in other countries wherever water is picked up in the tropics and transported one, two, three thousand kilometers to the nearest coastline. This is such a complicated thing scientifically. Could, could we step back maybe just a moment and each of you talk a little bit about how you got into researching this and, and, and your backgrounds a little bit and what motivates you and drives you to look into such complex systems, if you will. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I, I, I guess I, I started out trained in a range of, of different sciences and, and probably resonating with a number of uh, the talks that we've heard earlier today. I was persuaded by the power of the ocean actually while sitting in the middle of a force 10 storm in the North Atlantic and uh, I was sort of feeling the force of, of, of the ocean. And, um, 
it was exciting, it was thrilling. We were trying to sample, so I couldn't sample that particular day. But, but I did sample during that cruise, and I guess for me, what really came home to me, and, and, and this speaks a little bit of the ocean mixing, was that I, I came home, I analyzed those samples, and I was, I was making this analysis where the, the samples would change color in proportion to the nutrients that, that was present in them. And they were all incredibly low. I could barely see this blue that was supposed to be emerging in these, in these samples. And I had this one that was brilliant blue. And when you're on a cruise, you tell the date by the Julian day. You literally count the days through the year. And I had to sort of go back and work out what, what, was, what was going on that day. And that was the very day of the storm. And that really sort of brought home to me that I'd actually seen this, the storm mixing the ocean in action and bringing up the nutrients that were then making the waters go blue. And, and, and that really sort of drew me into understanding the ocean, understanding nutrient cycling, and in the end, drive plankton which uh, in the ocean and we, we heard a lot in the in the previous talks about um, perhaps harnessing the power of the terrestrial biosphere for many of the materials uh, that they have and I guess this is the, the, the plankton are just as powerful as the terrestrial biosphere and may well also be an unexplored broad frontier for some of the resources we may need in the future and even the carbon sequestration potential. So, so that's how I got drawn into this area of science. I'm less of an expert on atmospheric rivers, but I was going to talk about how we might save the biosphere if we get onto that bit. <laughs> right. What about you, Bob? So David, uh, my uh, earlier uh, science degree uh, was in Australia, and I had the privilege of being 50 kilometers from the Southern Ocean. So I spent quite a few hours contemplating the Southern Ocean and being down there. And hey, that was 3,000 kilometers circumpolar around Antarctica. So one really needs to look at the Antarctic continent with 14 million square kilometers of ice surrounded by a circumpolar ocean 3,000 kilometers wide as one system. And it was so great, I felt, that system. It impacts the whole planet. And maybe the best way of explaining it is that there is a, known as a thermo haline conveyor belt that connects all the main oceans of the planet. And it connects the Southern Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, and the Indian Ocean. And all those main oceans connect together at the Southern Ocean, which itself is circumpolar. And the wind and the water is flowing in the same direction from west to east. Uh, can you imagine how rough that uh, circumpolar ocean is? And then when you add between 40 degrees and 60 degrees southern latitude, there's fundamentally no land. The consequence is the wind system is phenomenal down there. And it is, explains the very early sailing ships from Europe who explored the Southern Ocean, went down the side of Africa and caught the roaring 40s. And that was that wind system on the circumpolar Southern Ocean. Uh, blowing from west to east. And at that point, uh, it's like being on a freeway. So for all those reasons, I, I got to uh, find great interest in understanding and modeling the, the world's oceanic systems and currents. Can you give, this is a very, very new sort of uh, realization of what's going on in this field to me, even someone who's interested in planetary science. Can you give us a bit of a view of where this analysis, where this science is going here in the coming few years? It, it seems to be, you know, unbelievably important, of course, and a rapidly evolving area of study, at least to a naive person like me who doesn't know much about it. Well, I guess in the, in the context of atmospheric rivers, the, the interesting component there, at least from my perspective, is the sort of ocean-atmosphere interactions. But I, I, I think uh, uh, the, 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 the term has already been used for me, at least, about the, the oceans. It, they were described as the heart of the planet, and, and I would tend to call them actually the lungs of the planet. But they 
represent this intersection actually of, of physics and chemistry and biology because you have, as, as Bob was saying so beautifully, these intersection between the ocean circulation, which is by and large driven by the physics of the ocean, but that ocean circulation is then impacting on the, the life that is, is in the ocean. And I think you're absolutely right to say this, that, that trying, it's, it's often not thought about because it's not here, it's over there, you know, this is the concept of the ocean, we don't live on the ocean and I've heard it be said that the challenge of recognising is that you can't really see what's in it, you know, you see the blue on the horizon and that is the ocean to the majority of us and yet there is this rich diversity of life and interacting processes within it. And I think trying to really understand it's, that there's concern. I mean, people may well have, have seen the, the movie years ago about the, the concern about the slowing down of this ocean circulation, which we know from paleoclimate that retreating ice sheets can put fresh water into the, the polar oceans and potentially slow down the ocean circulation. And that has triggered this incredible monitoring array now in the North Atlantic, seeing how fast are the deep waters moving down through the Atlantic, where they're drawing heat and moisture up towards the, the northern uh, territories and keeping us warm and, and, and moderate climates. Um, and so trying to understand that changing system where you've got the physics and the chemistry all driving changes in life, is, is, it is a real frontier actually. And I should say, in the, in the, sorry to take the time, but in the, in the context of NOAA, I think there are really exciting technological advances now that are allowing us to potentially start to see the ocean in real time. I mentioned this array, but there are autonomous vehicles that can go out now and start to take samples for us. But I, th I guess the key for me is we should never stop people from going to the ocean because it's really where you meet the medium that, and the process and it gets you excited as a scientist. All right. well, this, this is beautiful. And I, I would add that um, the global thermohaline, which means heat and salt, saline, that combination which is the driver of the conveyor belt around the world is also carrying a great amount of the nutrients and the biota with it. And I would add that within that conveyor belt there are major eddies, eddy currents which are stirring up uh, all these materials, including upwelling from the bottom. So it's a wonderful mixing device uh, that operates naturally in today's oceans. But as we all know, the continents are drifting. So as they drift over the years, it may take millions of years, uh, the ocean's configurations are changing. So the currents will change as well. So it's, it's really a, a dynamic activity. But if I could just finish and say that the atmospheric river in the sky, which carries water vapor from the tropics, those convection, vertical convection currents, carries probably half the water that feeds the, the mid-latitudes, as, as does the global thermohaline conveyor belt. They equally carry heat and water to the north from the tropics. And it's a, you could say the earth is set up to fundamentally support the physical processes of transferring heat and water from the equator to the poles, North Pole and South Pole. It's fascinating and it's so complex and so enormous and with such multiple things going on at once to try to analyze that all influence each other. And it's something that I really haven't thought much about. So it's sort of a stunning realization of another major thing that we need to keep track of with the climate changing. Uh, where does this go? I mean, how alarming is what's going on in this area compared to some of the other areas we've talked about today already, if you will? Well, I, I can comment that we've already heard from Stephen Chu just a while ago that should the 1.6 average ice 
sitting on the continent of Antarctica melt, if that were to happen, it would add 55 meters to the global average sur sea surface level, which is enormous. Whereas Greenland, should it melt, it's another five. And together, that would be 60 meters to global average sea level. So this is every port city on the planet, every coastal city on the planet would be un inundated and would have to either evacuate or re-engineer itself, much like London puts in a 11 meter uh, tidal barrier. But how about Venice, for example? They're just barely marginal. Shanghai, Miami, I mean, you can just name city after city around the world, port city, coastal cities, how treacherous they have to manage their future. But I would say that um, the chances of slowing down the global thermal haline conveyor belt, there is a chance it would slow down because of the ice, if it were to melt from Greenland or Antarctica, it would change the salinity. And that's one of the driving forces. And it would, cold water would sink to the bottom a little prematurely. For example, in the North Atlantic, you have a warm current known as the Gulf Stream past the United States, heading up and outflowing into the waters surrounding Europe. That is warm water, which actually keeps the whole European continent, five degrees centigrade above what it would be if there was no North Atlantic current as part of the global thermohaline conveyor belt. It's, it's amazing to know that. So we don't want it to slow down, right? And if you get too much melting of the Greenland ice uh, or Antarctica, you would actually have these impacts which would be quite scary. As for climate warming, uh, that could accelerate uh, this melting. And uh, uh, if I speak to Antarctica for a moment, Antarctica has 1,500 glaciers which empty out into the ocean. Uh, at the moment, they are being held back by sea ice which is surrounding the Antarctic continent. And that itself could be 15 million square kilometers of sea ice. But if that sea ice were to melt quickly because the ocean underneath it is warmer, then the glaciers would empty out faster into the ocean. So we are watching accelerated motion of the glaciers in Antarctica emptying out into the ocean because of this underlying circumpolar Southern Ocean warming and warming the sea ice, which is holding back the outflow of the Antarctic glaciers. So that is a worry in the, 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 the bigger picture. And I, I just would make a comment that, uh, for example, underneath the, that sea ice surrounding Antarctica, all the krill are being bred, and, and so the whales are down there. It's part of the whale superhighway in the planet. And I, I had the privilege of watching from the spot I mentioned near my home. Uh, it's a whale spotting location because of this mechanism. The krill are there under the sea ice, so the whales are there. But that's just part of the, the, the whole biota story that you can tell. Yes. I mean, I'll, I'll just add a, a couple of other things. I mean, the ocean's been doing a fantastic job for us so far. It's taken up a third of our emissions so far to date uh, from our anthropogenic burning of, of fuels and industrialization. But that comes with a consequence in the sense that you, if you've been drinking sparkling water or Coca-Cola today, you know that CO2 is, makes your, your, your drink somewhat acidic, and that is having impacts uh, uh, across the ocean 
particularly when you couple it with warming and these, these incredible warm sea surface temperatures that we've had this year, have seen mass coral bleaching, some of the worst bleaching of corals in uh, the Atlantic, where the little coral animal lives alongside an algal uh, partner, let's say, and, and when it gets too warm, unfortunately, that partnership uh, breaks down and the symbiont is expelled and if that is prolonged the corals corals can die and of course they they support enormous parts of the economy uh, through tourism so the the acidification combined with the warning warming is really quite challenging much as the ocean has been doing a fantastic job for us and taking up some of that carbon dioxide and in multiple ways we'll we'll uh Hope for the best, hope to keep talking about all this and, and to start moving in the right direction with many of these things. Thank you so much. Any closing thoughts that you have that we yeah, haven't touched uh, on? Uh, Rose mentioned earlier how we gather data, um, not only on the ocean surface, but below the ocean surface. There is a set of uh, 4,000 floats that are free floating uh, around the planet uh, that have been released and um, they're called the Argo floats. And these Argo floats automatically uh, float and then drop below the ocean surface one kilometer and then a second kilometer and they accumulate all the data on salinity, um, velocity of the water, temperature of the water. And when they come back in the surface about uh, uh, an hour later, uh, they transmit to satellite that data and it's downloaded uh, to the Earth stations. So 4,000 um, Argo floats are doing this job of data collection. As for surface uh, water, there's a direct relationship between wind speed and wave height up to a certain point uh, when it saturates. But satellites are giving us um, wind speed over the ocean surface by measuring wave height with their laser beams. So we're getting those two kind of elements quite well. But deep, deep ocean, it's a blind spot. That is the blind spot. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and what a, an illuminating discussion uh, for me. And, and we have many, many, many areas to look into and to try to help here as we move on as, as scientists and analytical thinkers. So thank you very much. Well, how about a hand for them, huh? David, yeah, can I add that I'm sitting now for the last two or three hours next to Sylvia Earl, and if there is one person who knows more about the global ocean than anyone on the planet, it's Sylvia. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you.